Johnson is the creative type director of Monotype, where he leads a team of type designers producing new typefaces for everything from brands to ebooks. He was involved in producing the first true type fonts shipped by Microsoft Windows. The Open Sans family that loads to more than 12 billion web page views a week, and many typefaces designed specifically for the Kindle, Nook, and Kobo. Please welcome Steve Matson. So I'm here to talk about type and typography. Um, I feel like we've moved into a, a new era of typography that I call Type 3.0. Um, I'm really glad that Rebecca talked earlier about some very specific uh, details in, in formatting your typography. Um, it inspired me to just inject this slide at the last minute. Everything that, everything that counts in typography is a subtlety. And I think that's, um, uh, Jan Schickold was a book designer, uh, most famously rebranded uh, the Penguin series of books. Um, I, I think it says a lot uh, because a lot of times people don't know, notice the typography until something actually goes wrong. So you know you've got it right when people aren't noticing. Everybody in this room and everybody who uses a computer daily is a typographer. Um, you could be just, you know, the, the choice to choose courier is a typographic decision. Um, the choice to make it flush right is a typographic decision. And if you're like me, I'm a fan of uh, types of the Renaissance, and so I might choose a specific typeface other than courier. I might get more ornamental in my typesetting. Um, and some people might oppositely be a little bit more fun and lighthearted about their typography. Um, there was some mention, a lot of, or a lot of mention in Rebecca's talk about margins. It's not just about the type and the typefaces you choose and how big you decide to make them, but it very much has to do with the white space around. Um, this is the uh, Van de Graaff Canon, which uh, basically the proportions of this page, this, this spread, um, was sort of the model for the Renaissance manuscripts. And uh, it works just as well today uh, in terms of uh, giving the eye space to rest in the margins and uh, good line length for text. Um, and if you're not familiar with this, you should be. This is something that developers and designers, if they've missed this in school somewhere, their school was lacking in showing a very, very important rationalized way of um, achieving beautiful proportions on a page. I was at Tools of Change last year, and um, one of the keynote speakers had the audacity to say that margins in a book were designed there uh, to be written in. And <laughs> after she said that, I think the loudest face palm ever um, echoed from the back of the auditorium as I just shook my head. Um, you know, really, I just couldn't believe uh, that was kind of a, a logical thing to even conceive of. Um, of course, the designers and developers now are challenged by devices and how do these you know, beautiful uh, rationalized margins uh, adapt to devices. Um, some of the manufacturers, all the manufacturers have given us some default settings which are sort of uh, default is ne not necessarily best. So, you know, choosing your own margins uh, are always, you know, probably uh, your, your best choice if you're really picky, um, especially if some devices continue to push text all the way to the edge. Um, so that you're, when you're holding the device, your thumb has always got to move because it's covering part of the text. Um, these default settings, I, I actually have the privilege of working with a lot of the manufacturers and, and helping them decide on the typefaces they actually put into the devices, as well as um, kind of giving an opinion about letting and, and uh, default margins and whatnot. Um, but again, uh, it doesn't work for every typeface, for every, every size um, and orientation of the devices. Um, we're just kind of shooting at a best case scenario. Um, and then there's, of course, the, uh, uh, what was the word, potholes, I think uh, Rebecca used. There's a big pothole in that uh, justified line of text there. Um, you can do all you can to get your typographic layout to, um, to work, and then uh, on a specific device it may go wrong. And then this is my favorite epic fail that I... <laughs> I came across. I, you know, I'm after after I put this slide in, I thought maybe this is just somebody's attempt at, you know, really avant-garde sort of drop cap. But, um, but really, so what I'm here to talk about is not so much the typography, the layout of your text on a, on a page. Um, I'm no CSS person. I, I'm really, I'm a I'm a print and book designer uh, from way way back, um, letterpress, uh, that kind of thing. You know, so this whole digital 
digital layout is uh, digital layout for digital uh, representation is is not my skill, but I do make the tools that you guys use. I do make the typefaces that you use to um, you know then lay out into books. So I'm going to take a step back and try to explain why I come to this type 3.0 uh, uh, moniker. And in type 1.0, we were dealing with physical pieces of type. It was a physical thing, uh, whether it was in metal or whether it was in wood. And then it was pressed into paper, a physical object. So all of a sudden, the, the word, the message, was, became this physical embodiment in this, in this book. And um, obviously, this is uh, Gutenberg's 42-line Bible. Um, it kind of kicked it all off for us printers. And this is arguably, you know, anyway, it's my favorite, most beautiful book I ever saw. Um, it's at RIT in, in Rochester. I got to see it as a student, as a freshman, and I just, it kind of blew my mind and kind of basically uh, um, picked my path of, to my future. Um, this, this book, the black was printed, but then hand rubricators were still in wide uh, circulation at the time, so it was hand colored after it was printed. And that's one reason why I really like the name of this book craft kind of a thing, because we are craftsmen. We're, we're not, uh, you know, the old craftsmen that's uh, going to risk getting their hands stuck in a press, you know, something like that. It's not like as dangerous as it used to be, but um, we're digital craftsmen. We really want to look at the past, and we want to take elements of the past and, and, and try to use what we do, um, use, use that as a, as a measuring tool for what we do today to see if we can do better. And um, speaking of margins, um, I don't think um, Aldous Minutius intended that white space there as a place to write in. Um, I, was, uh, I was still steaming over that comment uh, when I made this slide. I... Anyway, we we'll jump ahead 500 years, literally, to um, type 2.0, where all of a sudden we had digital type. We have this type that you can't touch anymore. It's, it's uh, mathematics and vectors and points in a, in a data structure. You can't touch it anymore. You can draw it and then digitize it and, and whatnot, but uh, it's still kind of un, untouchable. But what the digital type re revolution brought was, um, was publication to the masses. And we all know, you know there's good and bad with that. Um, but it really was a watershed moment. It was indeed the kickoff of my career working on the um, core fonts for Microsoft. Um, you know, I, I knew that you know, all of a sudden, you know, the power of publishing was in the hand of any secretary or um, admin or something that was going to make the office flyer. And of course, uh, bad things can come with that. But um, we still had digital, we had, so we had this type we can't touch, but we were still mostly focused on printing um, with the digital type. And uh, so we still had this physical embodiment of thought. With type 3.0, however, we have a uh, type that you can't touch, and we have text that is um, temporal. You swipe your hand and the text is gone. Um, and it's, it's really sort of a, um, a new thing because now at, at this stage of type 3.0, the devices themselves have brought us to practically print quality, looking at the resolution of these screens. Um, you're practically looking at, the, at a piece of paper now. And depending on whether you're looking at a mobile device or uh, your desktop screen, you know, type is also untouchable. The message is untouchable. You close that tab and the, and the message is gone. So that's really kind of where I come from with type 3.0. The other aspect of type 3.0 is the fact that not many, um, well, there's been sort of a shift, like I was saying. You, you've gone from resolutions of the 90s where you had big, chunky black pixels on 72 DPI screens to now where you have retina displays um, this is Times New Roman, um, how I hinted it for Microsoft in 1990, and how it displayed with grayscale. Still looks kind of like Times, but it looks pretty dark. Um, but if you look at a retina display, um, Times New Roman looks very, very light and spindly. Um, it's because the, the backlit screen and these very fine hairlines are now rendered with really tiny pixels. And so it looks very delicate and is not necessarily ideal for reading on screen. So kind of with any milestone, um, we want to bring the measure of quality from the past up to the, up to the present. And with each change in printing technology, with whether it was better inks or better papers, there was changes in, in typographic style. Um, this slide shows 
a book that was uh, printed by Aldous Minutius, uh, 1556, I think. Um, it's printed in italics, which is uh, something that people were used to reading because the manuscripts at the time were written in the italic calligraphic hand. But the main reason it was printed in uh, Aldous Minutius made an italic type was to save paper. You can see how condensed that is. And he was printing basically, you know, the, the romance novels of the time, these, uh, uh, the paperback kind of romance novels, and basically saving a lot of paper and um, still able to um, print a lot of publications. But you see how dark this type is compared to um, 200 years later, 1750, uh, Gian Battista Bodoni was printing very, very, very fine hairline type because he was able to. It was just sort of, uh, uh, I'm going to make it even more delicate and I'm going to make my paper even more smooth with new calendaring me methods. And um, people complained that they would go blind reading Bodoni's types. Um, I don't think that ever uh, happened, of course, but um, it certainly got worse and worse over time as by the time the late 1800s came around. Uh, type was extremely hard to read, which influenced Frederick Gowdy, uh, one of my heroes, an American type designer, um, to start creating better types and that, that held up better. They were better for reading. Um, he, would, he would design typefaces for specific books. So this is a typeface called Catskill, which he designed specifically for this book. Um, it was going to be printed on a certain kind of paper, so he knew he had to make a typeface that was sturdy enough to give a um, a nice dark impression on this rough paper because it was kind of an organic um, sort of rustic uh, story and, and whatnot. So um, Gaudi was kind of the first person to start developing types for these specific needs. Um, and the other type, text typefaces of the day were becoming so brittle and spindle, spindly and hard to read that he was kind of reacting to that. Other people like a student of his, William Addison Dwiggins, was doing the same thing. He was starting to print beautiful, beautiful editions, um, looking at uh, the masters uh, for different ways of navigating around a book, using these beautiful drop cap initials to help uh, cause these, basically wayfinding your way through a book. Uh, that's why the manuscripts have great ornate capitals in them from the Renaissance, because it helped guide people throughout the book. Um, and this is one of my favorite examples is uh, Samuel Kitteridge's Moby, Moby Dick, the woodcut illustrations and the rustic typography, uh, the beautifully placed uh, capital letters next to the C to form call, uh, just really nice, uh, very detailed, um, nuanced typography. But so, you know, this is all eye candy. This is kind of the best of type 1.0. Um, type 2.0, as you know, with uh, the coming of the digital uh, digital type to the desktop, you know, there wasn't a whole lot to really show for. Um, so I'm skipping up to type 3.0 for the reference, for the sake of time. Um, so the, the, there are very few typefaces really available uh, designed specifically for screen. And that's kind of been my mantra um, over the last few years. Um, 1984, Lucida was designed for low resolution print, but it also, because it worked for low, low resolution print, it works very well as a user interface font. And sadly, Apple uh, nixed it uh, with the latest OS, and now you have to try to read Helvetica, and God help you. Um, in 1994, um, Matthew Carter drew Verdana in Georgia for, for Microsoft. And they were, you know, obviously, you're, you're all familiar with them. They became sort of the, the, um, uh, the, basically the measuring post for legibility on screen. And not much was done between 94 and 2007 when Microsoft released the clear type fonts. Um, these are Calibri, Cambria, Consulus, all the ones that begin with the letter C. Um, so there's a handful of typefaces uh, to work with. And then, um, so I kind of initiated some type development uh, programs at Monotype where we would develop typefaces specifically for the e-reading environment. And we call them e-text faces. And um, one example is this Joanna Sands, uh, one of our um, uh, OEMs was very bent on shipping Gil Sands and their product, and I always, from the very beginning of our relationship with them, I told them Gil Sands is not very good for the resolution screens you're working with. It's not really meant for an extended reading text face anyway. Um, and I finally got them to uh, plug in Joanna uh, in, was it, I think it's been a little over a year now, uh, as one of the default or system typefaces on the tablet. 
Um, so e-tax faces, uh, why do we need them? And I, I think you guys kind of know from looking at different browsers, different reading environments, different devices, whether you're looking at e-paper e e or LCDs, you know that typefaces look different. Uh, the same typeface will look different everywhere you go. It's because you're starting with a vector outline, a drawing um, presumably done by a craftsman who really knows what they're doing, and then all of a sudden laying this artificial grid on the, on the vectors, and you get um, kind of a poor representation or a, an approximation of what the designer intended. And then you go to an e-paper screen and you've got another problem where, yeah, the pixels are pretty blocky, but you also have this, uh, this speckled effect in the background, which is actually being improved over time now with the latest screens, but um, it causes a cast, a gray cast on the background, and so you're reducing the contrast, the black and white contrast, and making it more challenging to read. When I first started working uh, with Barnes & Noble, in fact, on the Nook product, um, I thought, oh, Georgia, the obvious choice, um, because it was such a, it read so well on a computer screen. Well, when they put it on an e-paper screen, you can see how it erodes quite a bit uh, in the hairlines um, from its original, which is pretty sturdy and should have, I, you know, I had assumed it would work and they're like, oh, you better get over here and look at this, it's not looking so good. So we ended up uh, choosing a design called Amasis, which um, if you compare the two, uh, I think you'll agree the top is more elegant and finished refined looking than, than Amasis. But however, Amasis looks quite good on an e-paper screen because it doesn't erode so badly. More recently, um, not all the tablet manufacturers use our software. Um, it's a piece of software called a rasterizer, which puts the pixels on the screen. Um, if they are using our rasterizer, we do have the ability to fine tune. Um, this is all the same typeface, only with different settings in our rasterizer to help increase or decrease contrast depending on the characteristics of the actual device that we're looking at. I like to call this the 50 shades of gray of type here. Um, I don't really like to call it that. I just, uh, <laughs> somebody was talking about it last night at the dinner and, and I, anyway. Um, yeah, so it kind of shows the extremes that we can go in, in refining how well uh, the typeface renders on um, a particular device. And again, this is, this is available for LCD screens or e-paper screens, depending on whether the, the manufacturer is working with us or not. Um, and so we go in and we fine tune these to make sure that they look um, as good as they can. And in fact, there's also one that we're hoping will automatically change depending on the ambient light. So you will get a little more contrast if you're in ambient light um, automatically rather than having to go in and futz with the settings yourself. So that's on a software level. Um, uh, back to actual type right now. One of the things I just mentioned is controlling the contrast. One of the reasons any old typeface in your library may not work on a um, electronic reading environment is uh, many of the typefaces were rushed through in the 90s to from uh, phototype setting drawings to uh, digital drawings. And the digital drawings are now, they're, they're based on these metal drawings which um, assumed that you would have press, pressing of a physical piece of type into paper therefore causing some ink squeeze of, uh, and uh, an artificial darkening of the letter form. So the drawings are naturally a little bit lighter so that they will appear the correct darkness when they're printed letterpress. So you can see on the left, um, the original Baskerville that, that uh, Apple shipped with iBooks, the original iBooks, and the refinements that I made to it to create a Baskerville e-text typeface, they're um, certainly cousins of each other, but the proportions have changed a bit and the hairlines have changed um, to hold up better on a, on a high res, high pixel definition tablet. And this is the one that might be tricky. It, it's hard to pr project this one because um, this and this, you can probably see the e-text version gets darker, more rich, um, and the contrast is better for reading. The other, um, the other thing we work on is the body size. A lot of typefaces developed for print where they were assumed that you were going to cut a different um, typeface design for the different size that the designer was going to use. 
here, when, since digital type was introduced, people expect a typeface is going to um, scale from four point to four thousand point and look good no matter where in between you chose it. Um, here's a very delicate design, uh, scaled all the way down, the serifs disappear altogether and become almost impossible to read. But I've seen people try to set text in this typeface and I'm, you know, again, a face palm thinking, you know, I can't read this. So ITC Bodoni is uh, one of the few typefaces, digital typefaces that has a unique um, design for each size use case. So you have a six point master, a 12 point and a 72 point master. And um, you can see these are all set at the same size and the six point is pretty chunky. Uh, it's a little loosely spaced and um, the counters are opened up and on the far right, uh, the other extreme, the display typeface is much more delicate and elegant. So um, if you think about e-text faces compared to typefaces designed for print, um, we all design typefaces within what we call the M square. That's that purple bounding box. And the typeface inside there is Georgia and you can see it takes up almost the entire purple box. And um, the, the first A is Georgia. The next four are popular print typefaces for text. And you can see how tiny the X height is. Um, that's one, one reason because it's, um, it's sort of the, the old notion of what 12 points should look like, the print notion of what 12 points should look like. Um, but if you go to the far end, you have um, a newspaper design, a newspaper typeface. The same thing that people used to make typefaces uh, in newspaper more legible, making the X height bigger, more loosely spaced, heavier serifs um, are being used uh, by my, myself and my designers to make designs look better on e-paper screens and LCD screens. This is an overlay of Sebon. Some of you may know Sebon is a very popular book typeface um, for print. And now we have a version of it for setting in uh, e-books. It's much larger on the body. Um, in other words, it takes up more of that purple square. Um, the X height is larger. It's more loosely spaced. But it's, in this case, uh, quite extreme. There's other designs that we've done that are more subtle in the differences from print to uh, current, but this is kind of an extreme example to show you the, the work that we've done to improve it. And here's a non-overlay, so you can get an idea of the, the more rich color. Um, a large academic publisher has used Palatino E to standardize um, their books, and it's working out really well because they're sort of looking at retina screens as their default. Um, and retina screens are very bright and the pixels are very, very small and so you don't want the details to be very, as small as those little tiny pixels, um, they'll start to drop away. So that's um, already been in uh, quite extensive use. We'd actually go back the other way as well. Uh, the top design is uh, uh, Droid Serif, uh, a design that I did for Google. Um, pretty chunky, um, but intended for reading on a mobile device. Um, now we're making a display version of it for large sizes. It's more elegant, it's a little more tightly spaced. Um, but again, this is a nuance that you may not see in, unless you look at these sort of extremes where they're at the same size and go, ah, I don't notice the typography until, wow, that looks kind of, you know, that typeface looks kind of horsey to me when I set it really big. Um, but if you set the display version of it, you may not even notice that the care was taken to choose the display face. It just looks right. And we're not about just uh, taking old typefaces and making new versions of them for screen. We're also designing typefaces with screen in mind uh, right from the get-go. The top face is Malabar, which is shipping with, uh, it's been shipping with the Nook for quite a while. Um, and Isabel, another design we've done for reading. Uh, it's more of a newspapery looking design, a little more, <clears throat> uh, excuse me, more sort of serious informational design. Um, I love the shot of the Kansas City Public Library. Uh, and um, as backwards as Kansas is, <laughs> I'm actually kind of surprised they supported this kind of architecture. Um, sorry if you're from Kansas. <clears throat> But I wanted to use it as a backdrop for a, a closing quote. Um, 
There was a gentleman named John Dreyfus. Uh, he was Monotype's type director up until 1982, I think. <coughs> Very proper English gentleman. Um, and after he retired, he was exposed to all the, you know, the digital revolution and desktop publishing and whatnot. And he wrote in a paper um, the following. An allusion to architecture may help to give a clearer view of the importance of congeniality in book design. In a metaphorical sense, we live in a book much as we live in a building. Both buildings and books, from cathedrals to pubs, or from holy books to comic books, have obvious functions to serve. But a book or a building that is purely functional may yet be sadly inadequate. Our life, or I'm sorry, our joy in life is deeply influenced by books and buildings made according to sound principles that combine a lively taste and imagination with an ability to adapt and renew classical traditions. Architecture and book design both have suffered from rigid theorists whose teaching has led us to the making of impersonal buildings and books which are usable but not congenial. So I thought this was pretty prescient to be saying at the, bit, at the beginning of the digital type revolution to be now the digital book. Um, I think it's uh, a, a pretty good um, foresight of him to be saying things like this. So the idea of improving reading uh, is sort of what we're about at Monotype and what I've pretty much focused all my attention on. And I'm happy to take any questions now if you've got them. Just a quick question about small caps. Yeah. Um, they seem, obviously, they have their own design considerations in terms of weight. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, oh, God. <clears throat> but do you see, um, do you encounter particular problems with small caps and how they're rendered on different devices and so on? Or do you have recommendations about that? A lot of people seem to be avoiding it because of... Uh, uh, device issues. I yeah, think. small caps are a wonderful example of uh, taking shortcuts and making stuff look probably worse than if they had just left it alone. Because uh, if you use synthesized small caps, they just look like they're the wrong point size. They look too light compared to the lowercase around um, around it. So um, if you are going to use small caps in a publication, it's best to actually choose the font that has actual small caps, not synthesized small caps. And as far as the EPUB standard goes, um, as far as I know, it's completely legal and it should be done, it should be handled the right way across all devices that I know of that the small caps will render properly. But somebody's bound to stand up and tell me I'm wrong with, about that. <laughs> I'm standing up to tell you you're wrong. Um, <laughs> just curious uh, what your personal preference is for what type of screen you prefer to read on. Just for me for personally, I, I like e I like e paper. Um, I find it very fatiguing to look at a um, an LCD screen. Um, I am almost fifty, and I'm the only person in my profession that I know does not wear lenses of any kind. So um, I think, and I definitely feel the fatigue. Like I need lenses <laughs> once I've read for any extended amount of time on an iPad versus uh, my my Nook, my handy little Nook. Um, and that isn't to say, uh, you know, the question was asked, does every book belong in ebook format? Um, you know, that is, that could, that could be even made more granular because some books will work on an iPad, but they certainly will not work on an e-paper screen and so on. So, um, you know, kind of taking off that earlier conversation, uh, you know, I'll, sure, I'll look at a glossy magazine, for instance, on an iPad, that's fine, but you know, for reading, ex <clears throat> excuse me, extended reading of fiction or whatever, I'd prefer to use um, a Nook <clears throat> or a Kobo device that's uh, e-paper. Anything else? All right, nothing to throw at me. Good, thank you very much.